Hey, good morning, church. Wow. Well, isn't God good, amen? amen. So great to be with you today and, and excited that Pastor Brian gets to go out and use his voice in some other places. How I many you know we have an amazing pastor, amen? And uh, super excited about what God has given me to share today. Hey, would you welcome the online audience with me real quick? So we got Monica from New York and Lori from Hopewell and Stan in New Jersey, uh, Timia in Richmond, Reese in Richmond, and I'm pretty sure my mom is watching. She is 84. She is the only member of my fan club. She's in charge of it. And I will warn you that she will chew out the tech people if the signal is not working. She does that. But anyway, welcome the online audience. Come on. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, well, it, it, it is, uh, it's going to be a great, great morning. Uh, let, me, let me quickly share this because I'm here today. Uh, we are running out of time to sign up for our next missions trip. I am the missions pastor here, and uh, we are doing a trip in the month of February to the poorest country in the world, Burundi, East Africa. It is absolutely the best thing that we do. It is a life-changing trip. Uh, there's a wonderful orphanage there, a feeding program with about 600 kids that did not exist in 2018, uh, but because of your giving and, and your partnership with us, it's, it's just an amazing thing. And we could use a couple more people to go. We had quite a bit of interest in the first service, and I'll be working the table there in the back if you want more information. It's quite affordable as Africa trips go, and, and we would love to have you. Well, uh, Pastor Brian, a few weeks ago, uh, well, a few months ago, uh, told me that um, on, on our preaching schedule, we usually set it at the beginning of the year for me, uh, that this particular week I could just do anything I wanted. Amen? So that's a little dangerous. Uh, this is a free Sunday. And immediately I began to sense a new message birthing in me called Better Together, uh, not really thinking that this is actually could have been a part of the Indivisible series that we are about to do. I mean, you know the Holy Spirit knows what's up. Amen? Amen. And uh, I cannot remember a message that flowed easier that, that I wrote easier than this particular one. I really believe this is a word from God for you today. So I wanna share a word with you entitled, Better Together, the secret ingredient to extreme success in the kingdom of God. You know, you know, part of the responsibility when God gives a church or an organization a great mission, a great vision, and how many of you believe that God has given destination a extremely great mission and vision? Not that we would ever compare, we are for all churches uh, that preach Jesus, but I can tell you, I believe that the mission on this church is one of the greatest in the state of Virginia, in the country, maybe even in the world. And God has given us that mission. And, and whenever there is a great mission, there is great potential for division. The greater the vision, the greater the potential for division. Why? Because the enemy knows the power of unity. He knows that he cannot destroy the vision from the outside. How many of you know, no matter how much water is there, a boat cannot sink when the water is on the outside? It is only on the inside, right? If the enemy wants to destroy the vision and the mission of this church, it will not come from the outside. The enemy can blow and attack and whatever that he wants. It will be an inside job if we fail. Amen? Amen. How many of you have been a part of a church maybe that had disunity? Maybe that split? Maybe that just did not, you know, go the direction God wanted it to go? In fact, probably many of you are here today because you were a part of something like that that failed. Well, I don't know about you, but I am gonna do everything within my power to not let that happen, amen? I wanna make sure that I am a source of unity and never a source of division. Now, this is such a kingdom principle. See, nothing great happens in the kingdom of God without unity, and unity is the key to the extreme blessing and power of God. You might experience some scraps and leftovers on your own, but it is only when we are unified that we experience the full measure of what God has for us. I'm gonna start at Psalm 133. This is actually a song. It's called a song of ascent. It's one of three 
in Scripture, and it is a song that the Israelites would sing on their way to their festivals. And this is the festival month, by the way. It is written by David, who actually knew something about unity and division. I have a new book coming out in January, and I wrote it on relationships on the life of David, and I can tell you this man understood the power of unity. Psalm 133, how wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers or sisters dwell together, live together in harmony. There's an ease when unity comes. For harmony, unity is as precious as the anointing oil. Pastor Mark, nothing increases the anointing like unity, amen? It is when we experience the best of God. That was poured over Aaron's head that ran down in his beard. You ever had stuff in your beard? This is what you want in your beard, amen? It's not gross. You want the anointing oil in your beard. And onto the border of his robe, harmony, unity, is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is the highest point in Israel. What it's actually saying is that it, when, when Mount Hermon was good and rich with water, that it would water the entire land. How many of you know unity is what brings life to the entire land, amen? amen. That falls from the mountain of Zion, and there in the place of unity, the Lord has pronounced uh, the actual Greek word, or Hebrew word there, is commanded, God has commanded his blessing. God will always bless unity, even life everlasting. You know, the miracle of the church is something that has to be preserved by unity. Can I just say that the greatest miracle that Christ ever did was the church? How many of you know this is a miracle that we are experiencing this morning? Some of us, we cannot wait to get in the house of God because we experience God in a different way. Let me just explain it for a second. You see, I only have a couple of gifts, and thank God that I'm not the only one here because when the body comes together on a Sunday, how many of you know that all the gifts are represented, amen? This is a place where we supercharge the kingdom of God because all the gifts come together. Now, Jesus, he had all the gifts, amen? There was not a gift that Jesus did not have. So the miracle of the church is this. Church, a unified church, is as close as you will ever get to on earth to being in the physical presence of Christ, amen? It is a miracle when a church is unified. Now, like all kingdom principles, they are modeled in nature. I, I was doing some reading the other day about Belgium Horses. They say that this giant breed of horse can haul about 7,000 pounds, and then when it is tethered together with another horse, it can pull about, you guessed it, 14,000 pounds. But whenever a trainer will take and, and unify them, train them to work in harmony, it increases to almost 30,000 pounds. Why? Because there is a principle in the earth that's actually a biblical principle when we work together, we go much farther. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. One can cast a 1,000 to flight. Two can do what? 10,000. Now, come on, man. I'm not a mathematician, but that doesn't even make sense. If I can lift 1,000 pounds of ministry weight and Pastor Dan can lift 1,000 pounds, I mean, you know, that's 2,000 pounds. But when we get together, God makes the math go crazy, amen? amen? That's why the enemy is so afraid of unity. Another place in nature where we see this modeled is right here. Some of you have seen this, a geese flying in the air in a V. Now, this has actually been studied quite extensively, and I'm sure it is Art Pax Dowers that paid for that, right? And they say that this is for efficiency, that it actually increases their efficiency and energy by 71%. It is such a powerful thing that even fighter pilots use this on long missions. But it is more than just staying in a line. They say that they fly just slightly above the other so that they catch the upwash of the one that's in front. In fact, they say that this unison effect is so powerful 
that they are overly committed to it. In fact, look at this picture. This is actually a picture of something that happens with this. When one falls behind, two will break away to try to pull the other one back. How many of you know we all need to be voices of unity, amen? When one pulls behind, we all jump in. In fact, that constant honking that they do when they're flying, that's probably why we shoot them, amen? <laughs> My redneck comes out no matter what. I have shot a few geese, Pastor Kyle. <laughs> and the, the, but that constant honking is because they are encouraging one another to stay in unity. How many of you know the honking in the church ought to be that we want to be unified with Jesus? That is our constant cry. Stay in unity no matter what it takes. The importance of unity is really all over the scripture. And I don't have time to develop this, but one of the major illustrations is the illustration of the body. Romans 12, four and five. Just as our bodies have many parts and each one has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts but one body, everybody say one body, and we all belong together. I love Peterson's paraphrase here, the message. It says, each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. You can't get your meaning off by yourself. The body we're talking about is Christ's body, his chosen people, and each one finds meaning and function as a part of his body. So your human body, those hundreds of muscles, those 206 bones, those trillions of cells that work together, that is an illustration of what Christ has for you and I. See, your destiny is actually connected to other people. By yourself, you're not much, but together we stand, amen? amen. You know what you are? You're like a snowflake. You're kind of fragile and weak, just like me. Alone, we can't do much, but if we stick together, we can shut down cities, amen? If we said stick together, we can change absolutely everything. Paul goes on to say that it, it, he talks about like chopped off fingers and toes and how they wither. See, uh, apart we wither, but together is where we prosper. You cannot fulfill your mission alone. Can you imagine having a rebellious member of your body? Anybody have an older brother that used to play the why are you hitting yourself game? You know what I'm talking about? I had an older brother, he did this to me. He would grab my arm and I was too weak to stop him and he'd make me hit myself and he's like, why are you hitting yourself? <laughs> I wish I was the older brother, amen. <clears throat> I can't even imagine my left arm not wanting to cooperate or my, my voice wanting to say something different. It is only because my body is working together that I can fulfill the mission of preaching this sermon, amen? Can you imagine your favorite sports team? My, mine is the Kansas City Chiefs, come on. I thought I was preaching on unity today. <laughs> but I can't imagine a new player joining a team but wearing his old jersey and saying, hey, I just want those guys to know I still love them. No, you're on my team, baby. You better wear the jersey, embrace the culture, get in unity, or there will be no championship, amen? amen. See, we all know this to be true. Better together only works when all of the me's intentionally decide to passionately be a part of the we, amen? And listen, making a choice to actually fulfill your role in the kingdom doesn't make you less significant. Just cut off your little toe and see if you are as agile as you used to be. No, those hidden parts of the body. The Bible talks about it over and over again. In fact, the parts that we see out front are actually not the most important parts. I really believe when we get to heaven, some of those hidden prayer warriors are gonna get their rewards long before us that got all the accolades because we got to be on stage. Now, Pastor Brian said it well last week. It is a team sport, amen, this faith that we have. And the only way we're gonna make it is not everybody can play quarterback, but we all 
function together when we play our part. You know what the church is? Let me define it for you. The church, the body, it is the combined force of God's people following in unity the direction of God's spirit. Now, whenever I think about a combined force, I can't help it, I think about a river. I, I have a picture here I wanna show you. This is a, actually an AI-generated picture that, that uh, shows you like how a river forms. It is all the small creeks and tributaries that come together, and eventually, by themselves, they're not much, but eventually they can form a raging river. Whenever I was pastoring, the Lord showed me this one day because I was trying to manage a lot of different things in the church, and one day the Holy Spirit told me, he said, there are actually four forces in any given church. The first one is, and by the way, I did this artwork. I'd like some clapping if that's not. Uh, <laughs> I spent at least 10 minutes on this. Come on. Uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, the first force is what I would call current fighters. Have you ever been with somebody that no matter what you say, they're going to say the opposite? No matter what direction you're going, they're going to go somewhere else. And they slow down the vision and the mission of the church because they're always trying to swim upstream. The next one is probably the most common, and that's what I would call lone rangers. Lone rangers are people that they're kind of going in the direction of the church, but they want to do their own thing. Listen, you will never be great in the kingdom of God unless you are connected to a body. I, I have my own ministry. I'm on the road about 200 days a year, and, and I can tell you, listen, I willingly submit myself. I have three pastors. I willingly submit myself to three church bodies. Why? Because I'm nothing if I'm by myself. There are no superstars in the kingdom of God. In fact, God let that day die, amen. No, no, no. We are together, and that's how we fulfill the mission. And then there are what I would call life suckers. <laughs> These are people that they want the church because they want the resources of the church. This is the dude that's trying to sell you insurance in the lobby. You get what I'm saying? I, I had somebody go to one of my ch the church I pastored that he owned a business, and he actually attended five churches. He, he worked the church so that his business would grow. No, no, no. We are not life suckers. We are life givers, amen? Now, what God wants us all to be is what I would call force multipliers. That is when we all get into the current of what God is doing. We swim in the same direction, amen, and we add to the force of the kingdom of God. What would happen, my friends, if we all became force multipliers? I can tell you, we would experience a move of God's spirit that is so powerful that we would not recover, and the world would come to know Christ. We've got to be force multipliers. When I was praying about this message and working on it this week, God began to show me a picture of how, like, storms come together. Now, I did a little bit of study on this, and I, I don't want to bore you with the details. You can Google it yourself, but there are about... 20 or 30 factors that have to be just right for a storm to form. And if there is even one of them that is off, then the miracle of the storm never happens. I, I think I am getting old because I spent yesterday watching the Weather Channel. <laughs> and uh, I, I can tell you, this is probably why they're in business, a storm is always trying to form. Right now, right off of Mexico, they're saying it might be the next hurricane. There is a storm that is trying to form. And there are factors that have to work in unity or the storm will never form. Scientists actually say there's a whole bunch of hidden factors that they don't understand. They don't understand why a certain storm forms and why others don't. They don't understand why some storms simply fall apart. Can I tell you this from two angles? One, you guys that are prayer warriors, that are the least part, it seems like, of the body, you are the hidden factor that God is going to use to create the storm, amen? Yeah. But also, I would tell you this, probably every one of us in this room, 
have some form of hidden factor in our lives that has the potential to kill unity in the church. Pastor Doug, I, I just keep it to myself, but I've got a little bit of resentment. I mean, I, I just got this bitter thing going on. I just got some pride. I mean, I just really feel like I had a guy walk up to me at a conference one time, and, and I could tell he was really acting weird, and he walked up to my table, and he basically just told me outright, he said, I can preach way better than you, and I should be preaching at this conference. And I looked at him, and I said, well, that is probably why you will never get to preach at this conference. Because how I many you know that God opposes the proud, amen? amen? It's that little bit of immaturity. It's that hurt feelings, that passive-aggressive thing. Only the Holy Spirit can invade the secret territories of the heart, take away all those hidden factors that are killing unity. I believe that in the upper room in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says when they were all together in what? One accord, extreme unity. That is the day the Spirit of God fell, the storm of God's Spirit came in. And that day, not only were people filled with the Spirit, but thousands were added to the church. I believe that the 120, they weren't just praying, they were apologizing, they were working stuff out, they were placing, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, their opinions on the altar and getting in the same line of God's Spirit, amen? It is the storm of God's Spirit that we need. I don't know if you can feel it, but I can. Listen, the air feels a bit heavy right now because I believe that there is a storm of God's spirit that is gonna water the parsh lands of this Tri-Cities area, and it's coming, baby, and I wanna be a part of it. I grew up in central Illinois, and uh, about, I don't know, five or six times a year, the, the tornado uh, sirens would go off, and uh, I, I have this memory of my dad he would make us all go to the basement to hide from the tornado while he would go out on the porch to try to watch it. And some of my earliest memories are crying because I thought my dad was going to be swept away. And I don't know, this week God brought that memory. I don't think I've ever told that publicly, but he brought that memory back to me. And, and I feel like the way the Holy Spirit applied it is to say, it's time for the church to come out of the basement it's not just the leaders that belong on the porch. It's all of us, amen. We all have something to add. We all are supposed to be swept up in the storm of God's spirit, amen. See, it is only division that can kill the vision, amen. Well, I want you to get this. How many of you want to get this, amen? I want to experience unity on a new level. So I want to share with you very quickly Three sacrifices, three trade-offs that we're going to have to make to experience spiritual unity. The first one is biggest on my heart. We have to trade in opinion. Everybody say opinion. Did you know that sometimes opinion can be a sin? Did you know that? I'm going to tell you about it in a minute. Trade in opinion for the sake of the vision. I just want to ask you a quick question. Have you invited the Holy Spirit into your thought life? Have you asked God by his word to test your opinions? The Bible says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it gets down to the dividing of thoughts and intents. It even gets into the very attitudes of the heart. What I know is this is that my feelings are different than what the Holy Spirit is saying. There are somebody that, well, I just feel like this is right. I just feel like this is wrong. I'm just not feeling it. Well, listen, your feelings are the most immature part of you. I want to have what the Spirit is saying, amen? amen. You, know, you know, it's funny because we have this amazing capacity to self-deceive in the area of opinion. I, I, a few years ago, I was preaching at a church down in Naples, Florida, and the pastor in his office, he told me, he said, hey, the church is super divided right now. We're about to split wide open. There's no unity in the church. And I was like, well, thank you very much for inviting me. You know, this is going to be great. And, uh, and anyway, I got up to preach that night, and it wasn't set up like this. It was just one big row and then right side, left side. And you could literally feel it, like this side of the room hated that side of the room. And that, I mean, you know, this, this feels familiar, doesn't it? It's like America. And then that side of the room 
hated this side of the room. And so I preached, you know, the what God gave me that night, and at my table, and I kid you not, I had a dozen people from this side and a dozen people from this side come to my table, and here's what they said. We are so glad, Pastor Doug, you preached that because they needed to hear it. <laughs> and then this side would come, and they say, we're so glad you preached that because they needed to hear it. Why? Because without the Holy Spirit, we will always deceive ourselves into believing, listen, that our opinion is greater than the vision. No, 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 my friend. Pastor Kyle and myself and a few others, we serve on the executive team here at the church, and often we are the ones that will hear the vision from Pastor Brian first. And I can tell you that there are times when it has been in his spirit for a year. There's times when God has been putting something in him for months on end, and then he will share it for the first time to our team. And sitting in that room, how many of you know we're behind? Amen? Amen. I haven't had a year to process it. I haven't woke up in the middle of the night and God telling me stuff. So as he is sharing, because we're all leaders, amen? amen? As he is sharing, I've got my opinions, right? And what I do is I take my opinions and I put them on the altar and I say, Holy Spirit, my opinion is not greater than the vision, amen? amen? Listen, we either believe that God appoints godly leaders or we don't, amen? We either believe in the structure of the church or we don't. Now, it's not to say, and Pastor Brian would be the first to tell you, that he values our opinion, amen? It's not to say that I can't go back and say, Pastor, I'm feeling this or I have this caution or whatever, but at the end of the day, I will not begrudgingly follow a vision. I will sacrifice my opinion on the altar of God's vision every single time, amen? You know what a vision is? A vision is a God-given conviction about the future. It is a holy frustration, typically in a leader, amen, because God uses leaders, that births a spirit-led plan of action. And when this happens, a unified church, if we are gonna be the great church God's called us to be, a unified church must take their opinion and submit to the vision. Now, <laughs> This is so fun. <laughs> Come on, Pastor Doug. I am not allowed to have my opinion. Well, actually, if you are mature, it is your responsibility to control your opinion for the sake of the vision. Why? It is your responsibility to take your opinion, place it on the altar, not, not to say you can't have it, but you have to be mature and in control of it, amen? So that what? So it will not cause division in you and eventually in the body. See, vision is more important than opinion. And sometimes we have to sacrifice opinion for the sake of the vision. Now, what's funny is we all believe this. We just don't like to admit it. Uh, let me use two illustrations. The second one's more dangerous than the first one. But... Uh, there are some parents in the house. Any, any parents in the house? You parents, I, I'll just predict something. You have a vision that your child could have a clean bedroom. Amen. <laughs> My son was funny because I had this vision for him when he was growing up, and, and he, he likes to major on minors. So I would, I would share the vision of how his room should look, and I would come back six hours later, and he has organized his Hot Wheels. And I am like, dude, you did not get the vision. He's like, Dad, look at these. These are awesome. And I said, listen, I don't care about your opinion. What I want is for you to get behind the vision, amen? And you will not sacrifice the vision for the immaturity of their opinion, will you? It's not a married person in this house that doesn't know what I'm talking about. Listen, every single married person in this room knows that you and your wife or you and your husband, you are not always on the same page. In my marriage, I'm trying not to look down, I, I, uh, I, have a, I believe in freedom. She is free to be wrong anytime she wants. Amen. <laughs> People have been warning me all morning about this. <laughs> what? 
What is funny is we all know that at some point you can either be right or you can be in a relationship. And what do we do? Eventually we take what we believe is right and we put it on the altar and we say for the sake of the relationship, for the sake of the vision of this marriage, I will place my opinion on the altar. Come on, Pastor Doug, are you telling me I can't even have my own private thoughts? Actually, God is the one that's telling you that. Acts chapter four, verse 32, I could actually do a hundred of these. It says, all believers in the early church, they are one heart and one mind. Everybody say one mind. First, how many of you think that didn't happen by accident, by the way? They work stuff out. First Peter 3, 8, we are commanded to have humble minds. Everybody say humble minds. United in the spirit. I'll put this one on the screen. Philippians 4, 32. Make my joy, make full my joy, that ye be of the same mind, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Probably the best one is 1 Corinthians 1.10. It says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that all of you agree with one another, wow, in what you say, there's your words, and there be no division, everybody say no division, among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. Wow. So there's this process of maturity, of going like, God, my thoughts will get in line with the vision. I will not sin with my opinion, amen? You know, you know one of the big problems with this generation is we believe, we believe, or this younger generation especially, that we cannot follow a leader unless we 100% agree with everything. Well, I got news for you. I don't agree 100% with any leader, amen? amen? But it is maturity that can cause us to be in unity. Listen, my mind and your mind is not a personal playground where I get to think whatever I want. No, my mind is a throne room where I willingly put the Holy Spirit on the throne and I say, you are in charge, you are king, amen? Yeah. Number two, <laughs> you have to trade your problems for the sake of peace. You now, relational strife is the cause of a thousand issues. In fact, relational disharmony can actually kill you. Did you know that? There's a major study, you can look it up. It's called the Alameda County Study. It's the largest relational study ever done in the United States. It was over the course of a decade, and they had 7,000 participants. They found out this. They found out that lonely, disunified, disgruntled people, that they are three times more likely to die than those that had rich relational lives. They actually found out this. You're going to love this one. They found out that people that had really good health habits, like, like you know, they ate the right foods, they worked out all the time, that they if they were relationally poor, that they died much sooner than people that had really poor uh, health habits, like, come on, pass the burgers, amen, and, and, but they had rich relational lives, and they would live actually much longer. Now, I don't know how they figured out this one, but again, I'm sure we paid for it. They say that people in healthy relationships, they produced far less mucus than those that were unrelational. So it is literally true that if you are not a relational person, you are snottier than everybody else. <laughs> I actually just did this so I could tell that joke, amen. <laughs> they found that people that were relationally unhealthy, that they were 70% less in their cognitive function. Did you know, Pastor Charles, that being out of relationship actually makes you dumb, amen. <laughs> No, no, no. I want to be healthy in this area. They actually found that it affected their very white cells. It affected the way they developed genes. How, how many of you know that being in disharmony, it affects us at the soul level? Oh, I, I don't want to walk in this place and not be in harmony. Uh, God created us to walk in unity with each other, and anything less is the cause of a vast multitude of problems. Ephesians chapter four, verse three, make every effort, everybody say every effort, every effort, to keep the unity of the spirit 
The Spirit creates unity, amen? Through the bond of peace, Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, everybody say it depends on me, live at peace with everybody, get along with everybody. You know, I, 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 and I hope the team here would back me up, but I, I can tell you this, if you are cross with me, uh, not everybody just goes for you, right? I, I, I can tell you, as far as it be unto me, I will do everything I can to win you back. Why? Because whatever price it takes, we're going to be in unity, amen? amen. I, 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 I'm not above bribery, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, we, we will make this work, baby. You, you, you know what happens? You know what happens is that we get, we get a habit of being offended. That's really what happens. I, I have in my, my hand a calculator, and I think, I think many of us, we are mathematicians in the worst way. You know? So we're walking down the hallway, and Pastor Dan's coming by, and he doesn't say hi, and we start doing the math. It's right here. He's a jerk. I'm just telling you. <laughs> And then there comes Michelle. Well, Michelle, she wouldn't do that. So there comes Pastor Charles, and, 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 and he, he doesn't say hi. And it's, he's a jerk, too. Man, it's right here. I mean, you can't argue with the numbers, you know. You know and, and after a while, after a while, we're just offended all the time. So what we've got to do is to give our calculators over to the Lord, amen, and say, God, you are in charge of the math. You, you, know, you know what happens when you are offended? It's like here's your expectation Here's reality. Somebody doesn't meet your expectation. And so what we do is we fill the gap between expectation and reality with what? With doubt, with judgment, with bitterness. When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13, he wasn't just giving you material for you to say at your wedding. He was trying to tell us how to live. So you know what you fill the gap with when somebody doesn't meet your expectation? You should fill it with trust. The Bible says love always trusts. You should fill it with what? You should fill it with belief. The Bible says love always believes the best, amen? You should fill it with hope. They're gonna get better. Love always hopes. You know, the Bible says love keeps no record of wrongs. Man, I hate that one. Because when I'm arguing with anybody, I'm like, man, I wanna bring up some facts. I'm like, I could have been a lawyer. You know, You know, it's like, well, I remember two years ago you did, you know, and I got it, and I got a good memory. The Bible says you can't do that. You got to keep resetting it, amen? amen. No, I, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've gotten even better looking. <laughs> I, I, never know, I never know how this is going to come out. But, but uh, I actually, in June, I, I, well, I, well, I'll go back even further, back, back during COVID. I, I don't know about you, but COVID to me seemed like Thanksgiving for like two years. It, it was just... It is, uh, so I gained about 25 pounds during COVID, and uh, I've lost 21 pounds since June. And uh, uh, yeah, man, come on. Uh, it's all about him. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, how many of you know the, the, the weight doesn't come on overnight, and it doesn't come off overnight, right? You just gain a pound of offense here and there, right? And after a while, you're completely unhealthy. You're carrying weight you were not designed to carry. I had indigestion, all kinds of stuff going on that I never faced before. And it's all gone now, amen? Because how many of you know when the weight goes, the problems go with it, amen? You know, Jesus said it like this. Peter one day approached Jesus and he said, he said, Jesus, you know, there's this like person in my life and they've hurt me like seven times. You know, should I forgive them like seven times? He thought he was being like, like generous, you know. Like you go eight, I'm not gonna forgive you. And Jesus said this. Jesus said, it's not seven times, it's 70 times seven. Well, I've done the math on that, that's 490. Now, some of you already, you're like, man, that person is on 489. You know, you know I, I'm almost there, <laughs> you know. That is not what Jesus was saying. What he was saying was this, is sometimes forgiveness is a process, amen? I don't know if you've ever been hurt this way, but I have. I've been hurt so bad before that I had to forgive the person every day, amen? And it might go five, six months, and then one day I wake up, and it's like it's gone, amen? Because the process. No, we are people that cannot afford bitterness, resentment, passive aggressiveness. We just can't. Why? 
It's not because you're not important. It's because the mission and vision is more important than you, amen? And not only that, you'll do harm to yourself and you'll do harm to others. The last thing is this, and I'm done, is that we have to trade personal gain for kingdom treasure. I just want to say this quickly. There is a treasure that we are going to find together that cannot be found alone. There are things that God wants to do with our church that he cannot do by ourselves. Did you know that one of the last prayers that Jesus prayed was a prayer of unity? They can put it up on the screen. I don't have time to read it. It's in John 17. I think John 17, John 14 through 17, greatest chapters in the Bible. Jesus' prayer for unity is, is, is his heart. It's the goal, amen? He, he gets so intense in this prayer that he even says, I want you to be unified like me and the Father. He literally wants us to be as close to each other as, as, as like the Trinity is close. It's, it's, it's unreal. It's, it's a miracle, amen? But if we do this, if we get unified, there is a treasure that we will find together that we cannot find anywhere else. You know, I, 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 I've been doing this work for a long time. And uh, back when I was about 29, I tell this story on missions trips. Uh, by the way, if you come on a missions trip, you'll hear stuff that you'll never hear from me other ways. Uh, but I tell this one to missions teams in our orientation. And uh, I, I, I had been traveling for two weeks in the country of the Philippines, preaching at, at small crusades. And I came back from the Philippines. This is back when I was about 29. And I landed in Los Angeles and... and uh, for me, it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. I was on Filipino time, but for Los Angeles, it was like midnight. And so I got on a red-eye flight. I was living down near Miami at the time, and, and I was gonna fly this red-eye flight back to Florida. And so I was on the flight for about a half hour. Everybody on the plane, it's one o'clock in the morning for them, so they were all asleep within a half hour. And the flight attendant, she walked up to me, and I was sitting right on the aisle, and she said, hey, you're the only one awake. Would you like to move up to first class? And I was like, that's Jesus right there, absolutely. <laughs> Shut up, Lindsay. Uh, people in first class need, need Jesus, amen. Uh, I, I just had evangelism on my heart, and so I went up to first class. And, and, and uh, Anyway, she gave me a meal, and then back then, they didn't have the individual screens. They had like the flip-down one, you know, and, and, uh, from the ceiling, and, and, and they had DVDs. Now, for those of you that are younger, a DVD was like this disc that we got from aliens and and you could you could watch information i don't even know how to explain it it's just dvd and and uh and so she had five of them and i picked this one that i thought would be a good movie and i don't, I don't have the title of it but that movie changed my life and uh basically i'll just tell you about it the opening scene was um uh, there was a Confederate general and he is walking into his tent and you can tell that he's been mortally wounded. It's the end of the Civil War. And he walks into his tent and he's, uh, he pulls out this large treasure map. He puts it across his desk and he tears it into four pieces. And then the next 15 minutes, he calls in four soldiers from his army that you can tell have been like spiritual sons to him. And he tells them about this great treasure and he gives them each a piece of the map. And then before he can introduce them to each other, he dies. Well, now the next 15 minutes is these guys finding each other, and they finally do, and then robbers come to try to steal the map, and, and, and don't you love movies where, like, they don't mess it up, you know what I'm saying? Like, nobody gets greedy, they fight, fight for each other, and these, these new movies on, like, Netflix and stuff, by, by the time I get done, I'm just like, I hope everybody dies. I just, I just, I don't like any of them, you know? You know it's just like, they're, all the characters are so dark and jaded, and you know, and but they don't, they don't do any of that. In fact, they go and they find the treasure and it's more they could spend in 10 lifetimes. I love movies that give you that extra five minutes. Don't make me write the ending. I did not come here to work, amen. And so, you know, that artsy, you know, imagine what happened, I, I hate that. Now it gives you that extra five minutes and you see them buying a ranch together and raising their kids together. And, and of course the general was giving them more than just physical treasure. He was giving them the treasure of relationships. Well, when I tell that story on a missions team, I think I've done 600 plus missions trips. Often it's 20 people, 30 people, 40 people. 
And I'll say something like, for whatever reason, God has chosen to rip this map up into 20 pieces. Now, what's funny is sometimes I don't even believe it because I'm looking out at the crowd and I'm like, I would not have chosen this. You know, I'm like, I know you could use anybody, Lord, but come on, man, you know. And, but, I, but I talk about how you were the 20 and God's got 20 pieces. And then, and I can just tell you in 600 plus trips, I have never not seen the miracle. Every single time. It's like, my God, how did you do that? It's like there was a treasure that you did through these people that you could not have done through any other group on earth. I want you to stand to your feet right now, if you would. On your way in, you were given uh, one of these. Everybody got one of these pieces? Hold it up if you, if you got it. You were given a, a puzzle piece. If you don't have one, you can grab one later from the stage or the ushers will have them on your way out. But there, everybody just hold it up if you got it, okay? So I feel like God put this in my heart. I, 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 had, I had Lindsay buy this for me. This is, a, this is a world map puzzle. By the way, if you're a puzzle person, I do not understand you. Just buy a picture. I don't, I don't get it. You know, but, 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 but anyway, it's, it's for my illustration, I like it. And, and uh, uh, so, so we, put a, we put a red X as close to Hopewell, Virginia as we could get it. Here's what I believe. I believe that God has brought pieces from all over the world to this church. We have people from other countries on our staff. Jeannie and I, I'll just be honest with you, it was not a life ambition for us to live in the Tri-Cities of Virginia. No, I, I, I like KC way better as far as a city. But you know what I want? I want to be a part of the treasure. Amen? God is calling people from all over the nation, from all over the earth to be a part of it. And I don't know why, but for some reason, God has chosen to break this map up into 2,700 or so pieces. Now, we've got some extra ones. You know what this represents? This represents evangelism, amen? How many of you think there's thousands of people more that are supposed to be a part of the treasure? Man, some of these are gonna be at that new campus at the mall. Some of them are gonna be right here when we open up some seats. Some of them are happening right now. Did you know that Espanol is packed out today, amen? And uh, it's already happening. If we were to put this puzzle together, which I am not down for that. <laughs> you know, and just one piece was missing. How many of you know you really couldn't even see the picture? your eye would just be drawn to that one piece. Why? Because you are vital, amen? Come on, Pastor Doug, I'm a nobody. Actually, you are the, the apple of God's eye. You, you, are, you are what we need. You, you, you are a part of the treasure, and without you, we will not find it, amen? So I believe that God is going to do a work through us that he could not do through any other group of people on earth. So I wanna do something before I pray. We wanna do an act of unity. You were given this on your way in. If you need one, just, just raise your hand. The ushers will get to you. But how many of you know a great test in a family on whether or not they're unified is have dinner together, right? We're about to experience it at Thanksgiving and you will find out either the pleasure or the problems, <laughs> right? Around that turkey and stuffing, you will figure out whether or not your family is united or you gotta work on it. Well, together, we are united around the ultimate meal, the body of Christ, amen? Bible says on the night that he was betrayed. Come on, if you're a Christian, go ahead and open this up. You don't have to be a member of our church. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Come on, let's take it together. And then he took the cup of wine, and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. How many of you know we all need the blood of Jesus? Let's take it together. Praise the Lord. Let's give God a hand clap today. Isn't he good? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, I wanna pray this prayer together. I wanna pray it out loud. Let's pray this prayer together. Come on, play it loud and strong. Let's, let's be unified. Let's pray this together. Dear Jesus, I ask for your forgiveness for any sources of disunity in me. I take my opinions and I put them on the altar of Christ. Judge them by your spirit. 
judge them by your word. I want to be a part of what you're doing. I want to be a force multiplier in the church. Come on, I want you to pray this. I forgive. Say it again. I forgive anyone who's hurt me, offended me. I've been forgiven so much. How can I hold back? I forgive. Just, just stop for just a second and receive this. Father, just drain the poison of bitterness out of every hurt soul and mind right now in Jesus' name. Come on, just pray this with me. Say, say I decide to intentionally be a part of what God is doing in this church. In Jesus' name. Now, if you need to pray a prayer of salvation, we're gonna pray one right now together. You say, Pastor Doug, I don't know if I know Christ. Uh, listen, this is your moment. So let's pray this together. Let's pray this out loud. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. You rose from the dead. You did that for me. Today, I give you my life, fresh and new. I wanna know you, and I wanna be a part of the church. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.